I had an interesting experience for the first time at Super Happy Dev House a few days ago, where uh, I had so many people walk up to us and uh, tell us, you know, awesome, that I realized that uh, this is going to start to control. I realized that the first question I need to ask is, how many people here have already heard the news about Code Hero? All right. So this was the news story that broke us into the game media, and it was all the media. Um, you know, Zynga, which has expanded the market for games tremendously, is one of the big people, but there's indies too. Tim Schafer raised $2 million, we raised $170,000, and uh, this is the graph that transpired. This is $170,000 raised over about 10 days. And the reason that people raise 170 is because they really believe in what we're doing. And that success is all about literacy. And I'm going to make the argument today that Code is not a new type of literacy. It's not an enlarged definition of literacy. Code is literacy. And from the very beginning, what coders do has been what civilization has been working on. And we're about to kickstart the entire human species. So the first question is, what is literacy? And you know, we think about literacy, we think reading, writing, arithmetic. We think the stuff every citizen needs to have an informed say in society, to understand and to be understood, to have a say in shaping the future. And the essay uh, and numeracy, understanding numbers, these are the things that we test our students on, that we do to prepare them for life. But something has become increasingly clear, and that is that 100% of the things that we do in the world now that shape the future involve code. If you're a writer, your writing goes into a string in a computer variable somewhere before it hits someone's eyes. If you're an artist, your art goes through a, a format or a, a web page or something to reach people. And it's becoming clear that we're all increasingly realizing how illiterate we are in the face of this technology, which is the lingua franca of the day. And so few of us, like maybe 1% of us perhaps, are actually coders in the world. So if we have an almost totally illiterate society in the face of a new lingua franca, a new language of the land, how do we actually ask the question of how do we become all literate in the same way that we did with reading and writing? And the, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that becoming a coder, when you think of it as an identity, as like the nerd who is a lifestyle coder and that is what they do, is not the, the problem. In the same way that you don't have to be a published author to understand reading and writing, you don't have to be a mathematician to understand numbers and be able to tell like, you know, what your bank is doing to you. You don't have to be a coder. Not everyone has to do that. It's that to be a coder, you need everybody else. A coder is a person who starts a project, a piece of technology, which is nothing and completely meaningless without people that populate it. The users, the artists, the writers, the musicians. And all of these things come together, particularly in video games. So to make video games is to start to answer the question of how do we get everybody in the right column headed towards literacy? Now humans have made some questionable investment decisions with ourselves. Uh, Democritus came up with the atom, and uh, he came to Athens, and no one knew him. People rejected this philosophy of these ridiculous particles. And in fact, Plato said that if I could find all the copies of Democritus' ideas, I would burn them. Uh, he was a little bit sore about what happened to Socrates, and he didn't really, didn't really care for the idea. Um, but he gave us a great start, which was he said, bring the smartest people together, share ideas, and evolve culture together in an accelerated way. He called it you know, the academy. And a few people later, we had this theory of physics, Galileo, and the idea of, of gravity and all this stuff. And so the Pope, at one point, outlawed this and said it was heretical. And uh, that turned out to be a, a poor investment decision because he said these, these physics laws were heretical, and he was crushed by the laws of physics when this, the uh, chapel roof collapsed on his head. Uh, shortly after, Napoleon was offered a submarine, and he was told the submarine could break naval blockades. And he said, oh, I'll never be blockaded. You know, I'll command all the harbors. Well, he was blockaded uh, after turning it down, and then he was imprisoned on an island where he finally tried to reach out to the inventor and tried to get rescue, but he died alone on the island because it was too late to adopt a technology which he had passed on when it should have been adopted. Now, the ultimate technology, which we cannot afford to pass on right now, started with Charles Babbage. In 1832, Charles Babbage took some brass gears and started to think about how you could make them do math, and he came up with this machine. Now, he came up with a difference engine, and it was a series of repeated machines. They'd done calculators before, but no one had ever systematized it into like thousands and thousands of repeated operations. 
And he showed this simple prototype, because this was actually never finished in his lifetime. And he showed this prototype to a young girl named Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace is proof, essentially, that we have held an entire gender behind our back as a species since time immemorial. We would be exploring space by now. And, and what she saw in it was not just numbers. She saw poetry. She saw the ability to process words. She even asked the question, is it possible to make an artificial intelligence? Ironically, she thought it would not be possible, and now she is the artificial intelligence that is the voice of the game that we're creating. This code that she created was the first language which was able to translate what mathematicians had discovered, sort of a universal language, of, of the truth of the universe, an indisputable realm of facts. I was able to translate that into something which has now essentially eaten our lives. We all live inside of computers now. But at the time, it was not fashionable to teach women much of anything, other than sort of how to keep the home and have dinner ready for the mathematicians when they you know, got home from their royal astronomical work. And that discrimination is exactly what we're doing to ourselves, whether we realize it or not, by saying that there are coders and non-coders, by saying that code is a specialty discipline. You know, another age must be the judge, Babbage said. He realized that he wasn't going to get the backing, and he knew he would be vindicated someday. Computers turned out to be sort of a keen idea after all. And now we face a problem. 99% of the people in the world don't code. And almost all the cool things that we're about to do involve code. But we have a capacity building problem. Right now, there are huge problems, and unless we organize and get almost everyone able to solve these problems, we're going to face mounting problems that exceed our capacity to solve them. And we can do this by hacking upbringings of children, and code is the key. So right now, we have the ability to hack the way kids grow up to what they love, video games. Hacking upbringings is a way of taking what's already happened in hacker spaces, which if you don't know about, go upstairs to Crash Space. They'll show you all about it, which is the ability to organize and create and learn indiscriminately of whether you're a member of an institution or not. And take this, take our power level over 9,000. By doing this, there's already over 900 hacker spaces, either planned or operational in the world. Those are about to become 900 classrooms. The only ethos that we have is to spread the ability for people to create. And we actually have billboard signs all over the Bay Area that have grown out of this movement, so it's starting to hit the mainstream. And Hack the Future is an example of this, where we're teaching 100 kids at a time how to code. 100% of the kids who walk through the door are not coders before they get there and are coders at the end of a single day. So if you're saying to yourself, well, I'm not going to learn to code or maybe the next generation will do it, think again. And a 12-year-old might be your teacher if you come to one of our events. We have mentors. The mentors are people like me, who's a, a game developer, teach curriculum and textbooks. This kind of hacking curriculum is about to spread. And it's growing in a way that is made possible through video games. We teach kids the very first lesson is, you know, what is a video game made out of? 3D space, X, Y, Z. And we teach it by saying, this is Y, this is Y, this is X, and this is Z. And we get them to do like negative Z, negative Y aerobics. And what they start to realize is the video games that they're obsessed with are actually the perfect tool to become literate in code. And what's magical about the games, like Minecraft, is that these are the games that they play for fun, but they're inherently teaching you how they are built. Every time you learn a new mechanic, you're learning a little bit more about how to make your own games. And this is a map of Half-Life drawn by someone who played it from memory. I don't even see all the details in that. That's the entire game, sufficient so that if you were a programmer, you could take this map and rebuild the entire game from scratch. He memorized this just because he loved the game. So imagine if we can do this with all knowledge. Imagine if there's a video game of philosophy, a video game of mathematics. It goes way beyond Khan Academy because we can actually make these places that people experience. Now, Portal is a game which is sort of our, our role model for code here because you have a gun that shoots physics. And so all we did was say physics is cool, but programming is cooler. You shoot code, and when you shoot it, it takes effect. Now, we got some, uh, some early attention at Maker Fair, and it started to become pretty popular. We expanded it to the school thing. And the ultimate destiny of this is for the kids in the classroom, not just to make a video game, but to make their new class project, making video games that teach everything else. Instead of making a poster board for the science fair, they can make a video game. And I'm going to show you something that is kind of mind-boggling that we intend to make the, the inception of this whole thing. So a long time ago, before we did Code Hero, we made a thing called Primer. And one of the first levels we made in Primer was Sumeria. 
And this actually turns out to be a great tutorial. So rather than teach kids about mathematics and teach kids about writing and teach kids about all these things as though they are, you know, like uh, learning the received knowledge of their betters, why not have them do a collaborative project? Now remember I said that it's not about everyone being a coder. It's about people that are coders being the glue that makes a, a project out of all their creative friends. So you put together the person who makes the music and you put together the person who makes the art and the person who does the writing. And you start to have the ability to create something very unique. So suppose you were to take all the games that all the people are making in school, and suppose you were to combine them into sort of a sum of the works, a tree of knowledge, a Wikipedia of games. And, see this? If you were to organize those games, you'd have to have some kind of taxonomy. So we have a tree. The tree is the cosmos from which we sprang. And it leads into the roots of the past, the trunk of the present, and the branches of the future. So why not have the kids start with the inception of all of it? Let's go to the beginning of history and the beginning of mythology, and let's give them a history assignment where the math class can work on teaching math, the history class can do a history project, the writing students can all do this. This is something the whole school can do together, where programming is just a tool for introducing all of literacy, so that this is not an elective or an after-school program, this is reading, writing, and arithmetic from their inception. So if you recognize those codes, uh, in Slashdot terminology, that's first post. That is language in Sumeria being invented. So this level is not a level we're going to give to the kids. This level is going to be their class project to make themselves, to do the research, to do the writing, to create their own art, to make something that looks cool and different in their own language. Because where they are is where history was first defined. History's written records of reality. So they get to Samaria and there's all this food that's been gathered into the granary. And the people are starving at the base of the, uh, the ziggurat. And the priests are hoarding it all and trying to distribute it, but they have no idea how to do it. And you quickly realize they don't have numbers, they don't have writing. So you go and you look at their tablets where they are working on this, this mythology that, that inspired them to centralize agriculture. You know, step one is they have the ziggurat, they worship the sky god. Step two is they, they have a priest on the top of the ziggurat who rewards them with knowledge of step three, which is irrigation. And step four, more food than they know what to do with. So step five, they put it all in the granary on the top and wait for the sky god priesthood to distribute it. And so you look at them and you say, well, what's step six? And they go, well, what, what do you mean six? Because they only count to one, two, three, four, five so far. And you're like, what about six, seven, eight, nine, ten? They're like, whoa, that's brilliant. Maybe we can count the food now. So they go to the top of the granary and they try to count to ten, but there's still more than ten food. So what you do is you walk along the aisle and you do what the Sumerians, we think, what the Sumerians did, which is invent some little tick marks, which turn out to be really handy. And you call those numbers. And you do length with height to calculate the amount of food. You do addition and division to distribute it to the people. Pretty soon, the kids have just invented the inception of civilization and math as their first class project in programming. Programming is not a separate discipline. Code is literacy. And the very next step is, if you could do that for our granary record keeping, could you do it for the words of the stories? And so the next step is to teach them how did school come about? You invent the first text, the first dictionary, and you teach the students to transcribe that dictionary in the ancient Sumerian world, you become the first teacher, the first transmitter of knowledge, and the place that you keep these tablets is the first school. And the tablets that people write with the knowledge they gain is the first library. Code is literacy. It is not a separate subject. It is not something that we need to teach kids just so they can become programmers. It's going to become a cornerstone of the entire school. Wherever schools are willing to embrace this, it should be taught at the beginning of a school career, not after the, the math kids decide they want to learn programming. Programming could interest people in math. Writing, music, and art are all kinds of code. We all began a long time ago at a point where different kinds of code were evolving in different eras. There was a point where there was a, a physical code that emerged from a bank. And that physical code gave rise to chemical codes, which arose from supernovas, systems of complex interrelationships of matter. And what we're facing right now is an evolution to something beyond written language, something we haven't even spoken language. 
We live now in a world of applications and software that define us as much as our own words or thoughts do. So, this is just a little taste of what Code Hero is designed to build, of the timer beyond it. But we want the kids to make these. This is a, this is a, a tree that is a sprue for people to hang their class projects on. Imagine if kids start with the Big Bang and can make games about physics. And they can evolve as they go through the sciences and the humanities to make other games that teach about the formation of galaxies. They can start to actually understand what they're learning in school in the framework of the cosmos and how fusion gave rise to the chemicals of planets, which gave rise to amino acids. And what this all led to is amino acids led to self-replicators. And self-replicators led to a stable form called DNA, which speciated into all the forms of life we now have. So this is a table of contents. It's not a complete game. I built this prototype a few years before I built Code Hero. But this table of contents is now ready for the kids who are now going to be adopting Code Hero in the next few months to make their class projects to describe all the things that need teaching. So Code Hero is really just a starting point. It's really just a, a tool. And the purpose of it is to teach people how all of this led to the brain. And basically, the question is, where does this tree lead? What is the future going to be like? What are the, the choices that we're going to make about the future? And in Ada's time, she was literally the world's only programmer. In our time, many of the people in this room are the programmer in their family, or the programmer uh, amongst their friends. But it's time for us to teach kids about a world where programming is literacy, where code is just a starting point. And we can all make video games the same way we used to write essays. <laughs> Ultimate purpose of Code Hero is just to start people through video games which they love, to be able to create all the video games that need to be created, to teach all the things that need to be learned, so that we can make all knowledge playable. Thank you. Woo!